I'm really excited about today's discussion and I'm excited to welcome all of you to be part of it. As a, as a devoted New Yorker, I'm fascinated by the story of our city and curious about how it gets made, who's part of making it. It's a topic that's taking on even greater relevance in this COVID era where so many stories about our future are being told and written. So I'm really thrilled to welcome Kasim Shepard to talk with us today about this topic, storytelling for city making. Uh, Kasim produces nonfiction media about cities, buildings, and places. He's trained as an urban planner, a social scientist, an artist, and documentary filmmaker. He lectures widely about the craft of visual storytelling in urban analysis, planning, and design. His current research project, Self-Help Housing, which I hope we get a chance to talk about, Self-Help Housing, Incremental Approaches to Shelter since 1965, is supported by fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and McDowell Colony. His nonfiction film and video work about cities around the world has been exhibited at venues, including the Venice Architecture Biennale, the Museum of the City of New York, the United Nations, uh, the Pavillon de l'Arsenal, and the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. He's a uh, founding editor-in-chief of Urban Omnibus, an online publication of the Architectural League of New York. He spent uh, six years there working with hundreds of local architects, designers, artists, writers, and public servants to share their stories of urban innovation with a particular emphasis on housing, infrastructure, and the changing nature of cultural institutions. He's the author of The Culture and Craft of Practical Urbanism, which was published by Monticelli Press in 2017. He teaches at the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation at Columbia University, and he's been a guest lecturer at the London School of Economics. He's studied filmmaking at Harvard, urban geography at King's College, and urban planning at MIT. The through line for Kasim's work is really the use of storytelling to understand place, in order to intervene more effectively through both design and policy. He brings really a remarkable multidisciplinary approach spanning social sciences, film, architecture, and urban design. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Kasim and, and remind you to uh, please, as we go along, put your questions in the Zoom Q&A. And uh, Kasim, we're really delighted to have you join us today. Thank you so much, Deepak, and thank you everyone um, from the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. It's really such a delight to be here. Thank you for spending your, your lunch hour with us. I don't know, do we still have lunch hours in the work from home um, era? I'm not sure that we do, but I'm, I'm glad you're taking some time out of your day to be with us. Um, especially for me, it's a real thrill to be presenting uh, some of my work uh, in the context of a place like the School of Labor and Urban Studies. You know, I, I consider myself first and foremost to be an urbanist. So to be speaking in a context where urban studies and all of its interdisciplinary uh, influences and outputs, you know, especially that of the labor movement and of organizing and of advocacy um, is very, very stimulating and exciting for me. So I'm gonna share my screen and, and take you through a little bit of um, what I have to say. Is that working? Um, yeah, most of my own teaching and scholarly work takes place in the context of physical interventions uh, in the built environment through design and planning. And I teach currently in, in a department, as Deepak said, of urban design, um, a school of architecture, planning and preservation. But my work is very much informed by my training first in visual art um, as a documentary filmmaker and subsequently in social sciences as a geographer. And, and finally, through my education and also my practical experience as, a, as an urban planner and a strategic consultant for mission-driven organizations who are trying to tell better stories about what it is that they do. And certainly while these fields of practice are distinct, um, they're all in my mind about creating hierarchies and sequences of information. And that's a lot of, of what I want to sort of carry through some of the work I'm going to present to you today. Um, how do we do that uh, in pedagogy? How do we, how do we sort of foreground and invest in that as a skill? 
uh, that urbanists in all disciplines need to really sort of take seriously, whether they're thinking about it in terms of activism or advocacy, or in terms of design and planning, or in terms of uh, policymaking and um, you know political practice. How do you how do you create stories that are um, have empathy, have clarity, uh, that really sort of um, take something that we think we know well and defamiliarize it uh, to the point where we can see it with fresh eyes, whether that's with a sense of transformative possibility about the future or renewed understanding of some of the, the, the structural inequalities um, that have that have it, are, are embedded within that place. You know, place place really matters. I think um, if I had two words to describe uh, what I do, it's it's that it's place matters and really trying to understand what are some tools we can use. Uh, to unlift and to uplift and uncover some of those some of those truths. Um, so I'm going to pull from each of these domains a little bit to talk about why storytelling, um, or what I sometimes refer to as you know strategic narrative practice, um, is such an important aspect of applied urbanism. I've often begun talks like this with 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 this quote uh, from the poet uh, Muriel Rickhauser, which reminds us that stories have a material dimension, right? The universe. Is not made of it's made of stories, not of atoms. Um, they have a material dimension that is constitutive of our world through the social and cultural bonds that they foster. And this notion, of course, speaks to the positive and, and the vital force that stories play in our world. But I'm also really aware, increasingly, um, that especially as narrative change work uh, gains ground as a legitimate domain of advocacy and activism. We also have to remember, of course, the stories aren't just congenial. Um, they also actively constitute the dominant worldviews that maintain a lot of the structural inequalities uh, that I know everyone at the School of Labor and Studies is, is really invested in upending. For example, as one example that I'll get to towards the end of my talk, you know, right now in my current research um, about housing, I'm contending with the deeply embedded story that that the theories of mainstream economics apply to the housing market at, you know, just as much as they might to the production of widgets. And that's a story we very much need to challenge. So I think it's important to keep in mind both the material constitutive value of stories as something that binds us together um, as people, uh, but also as uh, stories are also have this, have, can exert a power to, to maintain the status quo in ways that we also need to be aware to challenge. So when I talk about the importance of learning about storytelling, it's both to tell stories, but also to understand the stories that are being told to us um, so that we might be you know, critical actors uh, in, in mediating some of that. Um, in urbanism, you know, in my field, um, we've always told stories, right? Uh, even though we've sometimes allowed some of the ways we visualize information uh, or seek to provoke action to seem more like objective facts than it really is. We've always used mapping to understand urban phenomena. This is a map from you know, 18th century Rome, really trying to understand the dimensions of public space and private space, um, what a commoner was allowed to walk through versus what a commoner was not. And this really sort of informs to this day how we understand two-dimensional representations of, of, of space and the grain and the density of cities. Um, you know, epidemiology, which has been on all of our minds in the last year and a half during the pandemic, uh, very much got its start, as many of you know, alongside urban planning, both were professionalized in much the same way around really trying to activate um, information and data about public health uh, and, and make that visible. But these, of course, are not just visualizations of, of data and experience, they are stories. They are very much authored and subjective um, accounts of, of how we actually, both how we measure, but also how we present information in order to inspire particular kinds of action. We've also always used images, uh, visual stories to humanize social challenges, uh, whether it's um, you know going back to 1890 in, in our city, in New York City, and Jacob Reese's pioneering um, photography and, and journalism about the conditions uh, in, in immigrant neighborhoods in the Lower East Side primarily, uh, that really not only were about exposing powerful people to the realities of lived experience, but also really moved policy um, in very serious ways in terms of the multiple dwelling law, in terms of the Tenement House Act. These were things that were very directly responsive in how we sort of regulated and legislated uh, residential living in the city in response uh, to images that were provocative about existing conditions. You know, those of you from, from the labor movement will recognize the importance of this kind of image. 
um, uh, from another sort of what at the time was called muckraking journalism, what we would now just call investigative journalism, telling stories about the uh, existing conditions and the exploitation of child labor, which again really sort of moved moved the needle on what was considered um, necessary action to take. You know, these days, um, I think as storytelling does start to gain ground in professional practice, uh, it's important to really kind of disaggregate the various things that we mean by it. You know, are we thinking about storytelling uh, in terms of advocacy, right? In terms of persuading people with power of the effectiveness of a particular strategy, or are we thinking about it in terms of uh, convincing a wide public of a particular product's importance, right? Marketing something. Are we thinking about it in a way to market something in order to spark specific behavior change? Or are we thinking about it as a, as a form of community engagement? You know, one of the, one of the formats and, and practices of storytelling that I find most compelling in terms of how it's influencing practice right now uh, within urbanism is the notion of really trying to use a storytelling framework um, to identify what the problem is, to use it to co-create problem identification exercises with local stakeholders not exclusively to use storytelling to get buy-in from stakeholders after a solution has already been formulated. Um, and within you know, my specific training, specifically as a planner, I, I think of a lot of, um, of what I do, and especially what I offer to my students, but also what I offer to my clients, but most, most specifically what I offer to my students pedagogically is a, a suite of, of qualitative skills for interpreting existing conditions that really, I hope, gives people tools to deal with what um, the great uh, planner and sort of urban, urban theorist Kevin Lynch uh, wrote about in a book he co-authored with Gary Hack in 1984, a constant anxiety about the spirit of place, right? Any plan they write, however radical, maintains some continuity with the pre-existing locale and understanding that takes time and effort. And especially in this moment where we are awash in so much data, that enables us to measure and count and calculate domains um, and dimensions of urban experience. I think it's really all the more important, therefore, to assert the primacy and the importance of qualitative interpretive skill, especially to deal with that relationship between whatever it is we're proposing and what has come before, right? How can we use qualitative skills to really understand um, the specificity of existing conditions? Um, Kevin Lynch is probably most famous within urbanism, uh, not for this textbook site planning from the 80s, but from his book that came out in 1959, 1960, The Image of the City, which really gave us, uh, you know, the ideas of cognitive mapping by breaking down urban experience through a detailed social scientific survey of how people perceived a few different places. Um, it was Boston, Jersey City, and Los Angeles, and broke down a taxonomy of urban experience, right? The paths, the edges, the districts, the nodes, and the landmarks really asking people to really um, respect and rely upon their, their cognitive map of how they understood how, how we get around and how we understand space. And I, I really keep that in mind, you know, that sort of urban framework of, of, of perceptual mapping, of cognitive mapping, um, and try and bring marry that with some really basic elementary expository structure stuff, you know, that many of us learned um, probably in middle school, right? Um, how do you sort of structure an essay? And I think those things, while elementary, are, are incredibly important to bear in mind in this moment where there's so much flux in how we actually create media, because all of us are now not only consumers of media, but creators as well, um, and really bring back some of those, those core lessons um, that are important to, to remind ourselves of, the importance of uh, who you are when you're telling a story, what is your position, what is your privilege, uh, where are you standing physically, but also where are you standing um, in terms of, of, of your position of power in a relationship, but also who your audience is, right? Um, uh, what is their motivation? How can that motivation be augmented? Um, and I think it's important also to think about what all stories have, right? Stories have characters. There are people who are doing things. Uh, those things are actions, right? Not descriptions of conditions, but actually people moving through space um, and having things act on them. And you can think about characters and actions also in terms of protagonists, but also antagonists, right? Who is standing in our way. And I mean, this is basic sort of myth-making Joseph Campbell stuff about you know, the, the theory of stories um, writ large, but it applies very, very, very important in important ways um, to how we think about telling narratives about urban change, both the kind of change you wanna see and also how we talk about our own work as urbanists. 
probably the most interesting and important to me in my work, um, especially given the, the, the emphasis I've always placed on, um, on, on visual representation of existing conditions is the setting, right? The context, where is a story taking place and how can you um, evoke that uh, both in terms of, of your characters and the actions your characters take, uh, but also in terms of the essential qualities of that place. Um, and then classically, you know, most stories always contend with lessons or morals. Um, and a lot of the stories that I, I tell don't necessarily have that as an explicit part of the story, um, but it's embedded in there. Not so much lessons that are prescriptive in terms of this is the specific action that needs to take or the specific policy that needs to be adopted, um, but this is a new way of seeing something that you think you already know pretty well and how can you sort of learn to see it an, anew. And that, of course, requires authenticity, you know, knowing who you are, again, as a speaker and, and knowing who your audience is, empathy with that audience, really understanding where they're coming from, what their motivations are, how those motivations may or may not be augmented, and then clarity, right? Uh, not just being as, as brief and cogent and concise as possible, but also increasingly important in this world where we have so many media formats at our disposal, um, matching the medium to the content, not the content to the medium, um, figuring out what it is you're trying to represent and then finding the appropriate way to tell that. You know, some, some essays should be blog posts, uh, some books should be videos, some exhibitions really want to be books, um, and really trying to, to, to be very intentional about how you choose the appropriate format um, for, for the message you're trying to convey, not trying to jam pack your message into a predetermined form. Um, specifically in, in, in urbanism, I think uh, there's something that comes between the articulation of the context and the solution, uh, which is the idea of vision, right? How will the world be different after your solution? And with, with my students in particular, who, um, as Deepak mentioned, are students of, of urban design, and I think this applies to all designers, generally, they're incredibly skilled at visualizing an imagined future, right? at visualizing uh, how the world will be after their intervention um, has taken place. Um, and so I really see part of my pedagogical intervention in, is to try and really get people to slow down and foreground into their vision um, a little bit more intentionality around representing existing conditions. Um, and so if you'll permit me to, to, to dive a little deep into a little bit of theory just for a moment before I get into some practical examples. For me, um, articulating this, articulating this sort of um, move from, from context to solution through vision requires sort of three different steps. I think of those as observation, followed by interpretation, and then finally getting to communication, right? Communication is the part that has an audience. But before that, there are two critical elements of any storytelling practice um, that I think really needed to be emphasized as, as distinct steps in your process, right? The first is observation, going there, walking the streets, um, looking for details, looking for those, those parts that speak for the whole. And this is something where my you know, background and training um, in filmmaking really comes in handy, really trying to, to be forced to focus on one specific detail that can evoke some sense of a broader condition. That's maybe what we might think of in social science as sort of the data collection uh, phase, right? But then how do you how do you do the sense making, right? How do you make sense of that data? That's uh, what I think of as the most interesting and sort of intellectually active part of this process, which is interpretation. Um, and only when that process has really run its course can you get towards the final communication part, which is sort of present presenting to an audience, identifying how what the choreography might be of how your story is going to meet its people, right? Whether it's a pamphlet that's distributed or a speech that's delivered or a, you know, a, a, a storytelling circle in which everybody is sharing or something that's distributed on the web or through social media. Those are all questions of communication, but you can't even get there um, in an effective way unless you've done the hard work of interpretation. And for me, um, one of the core elements that interpretation requires is defamiliarization, right? Taking something that we think we know very well, uh, that we take for granted, perhaps we walk by it every day, um, whether it's you know conditions of structural inequality or just conditions of poor maintenance of a particular piece of infrastructure we use. Um, things that we think we know, how can we actually uh, uh, defamiliarize them to see them anew, right? 
Um, and, and, and for this, I often turn to uh, perhaps uh, somewhat of an of a, um, abstruse source uh, from literary theory, from Russian literary theory in the 20s, um, Viktor Shlavsky and his theory of prose, who reminds us the purpose of art, in his view, is to lead us to the knowledge of a thing through seeing it not just recognizing it. You know, you, you can equate this to what someone will tell you in a life drawing class, right? Uh, draw what you see, not what you know. Um, and I think there's something to the process of narrative defamiliarization that reminds us that in order to see something uh, from a completely new perspective, we need to take it out of its context and juxtapose it with other elements of information, other elements of story um, that can allow us to see it anew. Again, either as a field for some sense of transformative possibility, how are we going to change this condition, or to understand the underlying conditions uh, that have really fed into why it is the way that it is. Um, one really sort of, you know, I, I was reminded of, of, of the importance of Viktor Shlavsky's uh, definition of defamiliarization in a talk I saw in uh, 2011 from the, a former mayor of Bogota, Antanas Mokus. Um, who was dealing with a with a with a really intense um, traffic problem uh, in his city, and he went through uh, kind of a schema of okay, what is going to actually enable me with my power as as mayor, limited as it is, um, to change behavior, right? Um, and he recognized that you know respect for legal norms was not going to change people's driving behavior. Um, the fear of legal sanction or you know tickets or any kind of inf in infractions is, was not going to change the way people drove or the way people thought about the street and the public realm nor was the fear of guilt or any sense of moral gratification he, he had this theory which he tested and proved that the only thing that would actually change behavior and make people realize just how damaging the way in which people were flouting traffic norms was being um, was to shame them, to publicly shame them. And so he hired mimes um, to point out the ways in which people were flouting traffic laws, which was a, you know, a pretty extreme and performative case of defamiliarizing um, a, a, a habitual uh, set of behaviors around traffic. Uh, but it really worked. Uh, the fear of shame really um, was helpful. And, and for me, even though you know, this is a, a, a funny and recent example of, of, of an extreme and performative case of using defamiliarization to um, change behavior, um, it really goes back to the foundations of urban studies, right? To the, the first sociologists, um, uh, mostly writing in the German language around the turn of the last century, um, who were really, really trying to grapple with the condition of the city as a very specific mental state, right? And so Zimmel, in the metropolis and mental life, I still assign this in the first week of all of my classes, um, because of the way he really hones in on the specific experience and the psychological condition of being in a city in terms of the mask of rationality, the blase attitude that the urban citizen um, um, throws up around herself in order to inure herself to all of the onrushing stimuli uh, that, that dense cities um, provoke. And you know, he, he reminds us that as man is a differentiating creature, his mind is constantly stimulated by the difference between two different kinds of impressions. Um, and he talks in these very visual terms about the rapid crowding of changing images, the sharp discontinuity in the grasp of single glance, and the unexpectedness of onrushing conditions which the metropolis creates. And for me, that's, that's very, very, very important. Um, it's a very important connection to how I first learned to represent cities, which was through the language of, of film and specifically film editing. Um, when, I, when I studied film, um, I did it with, with razor blades and tape um, on 16 millimeter, which is you know, no longer the majority of how moving images are produced uh, because we have so many technological possibilities that make it more efficient. But it really, uh, what, it, what it forced us into was um, an extreme economy of how we chose what to shoot and what to um, represent when we were putting together juxtaposing distinct images of urban experience. Uh, this was you know, the kind of flatbed editing table um, in which I first learned how to, uh, how to represent cities. Um, and, and the word edit, I think, is an important one to keep in mind when we're talking about storytelling, because it's not exclusively all generative all the time, right? It's also about having a mass of, of material um, and then finding out again how, how to, through trial and error in many cases, how to devise an appropriate sequence, an appropriate hierarchy of that information. I think it's important to remember that, you know, in common usage to edit something um, most often refers to changing it, to, to removing parts of it, 
to subtract, to censor, to revise. But counterintuitively, if you look at where the word came from in English, uh, it's likely a back formation of editor, which emerged from the word addition. The literal meaning of addition is the number of copies struck from a particular plate and entered the English language around the same time that Gutenberg uh, invented the printing press. So in the early 15th century, an addition was a version, a translation, a form of a literary work. Um, but it soon became, by the 1550s, an act of publishing. The word comes from the Latin editionum, a bringing forth, a producing. Um, so while the contemporary usage indicates a subtraction or a correction, its original meaning was to bring forth, to produce something new, right? To put dissimilar things together in a way to bring out uh, something that was more than some of its parts. And that idea of, of specific fragments of visual information becoming more than some of their parts is very central to how in, in cinema, um, the theory of montage has been formulated as the primary meaning giving act to what cinema can do. The juxtaposition of dissimilar um, shots and fragments of experience, different views and perspectives into one coherent whole um, is, is you know, one of the primary ways in which we can represent not only drama, but also space, how we can represent the spatial dynamics uh, how we can represent uh, the perceptual and the influence on perception of the built environment. This is Sergei Eisenstein, who had these very um, complicated schema using you know, music as, a, as an analogy to understand the importance of montage as, as a meaning giving act in cinema. Um, but it really informed um, um, politics in really important ways. I mean, obviously in urbanism, we have the work of Walter Benjamin and many other people who really believe deeply in the power of montage. Uh, to, to be revolutionary, to be quite literary revolutionary, um, representation of the dialectic, if you will. Um, but it also the same sort of visual language of the distinct, uh, the juxtaposition of distinct imagery um, really gave rise to, to a wide range of applications, um, not just in, in service of, of a revolutionary politics of you know, formalist representation of urban experience, um, but also, it, this was really the language, the cinematic language, in which large-scale master planning projects, um, particularly uh, during the New Deal, were sold to the people, right? Um, whether it was, you know, really using some of the same sort of visual techniques that were used in um, Russian and German experimental films in the 20s, 10 years later, using them to argue for the importance of the Tennessee Valley Authority, um, to argue for the importance of the federal responses to the dust storms um, of the Dust Bowl. Um, and, and these are connections that are, you know, not always um, remembered because the histories of film and, and, and the histories of sort of uh, literary analysis of, of American experience and the histories of, of planning and urbanism have become disjointed. But I think it's really important to remind ourselves of a lot of the common origins and how we tell these stories because not only are these how a lot of stories of the importance of top-down master planning were, were, were foisted upon the public, they also contained within them the tools of the resistance to those same projects. Um, so, you know, we have in, in our city and in American urbanism, this, um, this, this, this cliched and over-referred to um, dynamic between top-down and bottom-up, between the, you know, the Robert Moses and the Jane Jacobs, but I think more important than how those two ideas have been oversimplified and, um, and seem to be the major dynamic in urbanism, it's important to look rhetorically at the tools, the, the storytelling tools um, that each of these uh, positions utilized, right? Um, and so, you know, I think even more important than, than Jane Jacobs' uh, contributions in terms of what she was advocating for, in terms of mixed use, in terms of eyes on the street, in terms of a particular kind of scale and density, is to think, look at her method, right? How did she make the case uh, for those types of, um, for, that, for that vision of urbanism, for that vision of what um, urban life could and should be? Um, and it was, again, using the tools of montage, right? Marshall Berman, in what is probably one of the best books in, ever written about cities uh, in English, All That a Solid Melts Into Air, reminds us that while Jacob's prose often sounds plain, almost artless, She's in fact working within um, the genre of urban montage alongside Ulysses, Berlin's Symphony of a Great City, um, Ziga Vertog's Man with the Movie Camera. And so I try to keep all this in mind, right? I try and when I'm, when I'm encouraging my students to look at New York City as a, as a laboratory of experiments in 
how we've not only intervened in cities, but also how we have represented them, to think about the, the how we sequence and represent individual details, right? What is the part that speaks for the whole that we can juxtapose into a sequence that can reveal some more, something more about the existing conditions um, that we seek to understand in advance of trying any particular intervention. So I've been very fortunate to be able to think about this um, in lots of different contexts around the world. These are just some of the cities in which I've been fortunate enough to work, either to, to write something about it or to do a planning project or to, to make some um, uh, visual work, most often a film. Um, my work kind of takes four different major categories. Um, teaching is obviously very important to my practice. Um, but as I stated at the beginning, I, I got my start as a, as a documentary filmmaker. Um, and so I've also had a lot of really fortunate experiences around the world, um, working on exhibitions and documentaries, uh, really trying to bring some of the stuff I was just talking about into specific applied contexts, um, whether it's to you know, ground exhibition visitors in the sensory experience of the place before they go on to see an exhibition that exposes uh, them to new designs for that place. Um, or whether it's, you know, in other contexts, uh, really trying to, to, to use the language of documentary filmmaking to, to reach different audiences about the, some of the urban dynamics that we seek to understand in order to um, augment or enhance in some way. Um, I also have a lot of experience in writing and in online journalism and in sort of moving between those two modes, which I think is a really increasingly important um, uh, translation act that we should, we should spend some time as a discipline really sort of thinking through um, what, what are the benefits of a, of a widely distributed online um, format for, for representing specific case studies of, of urban transformation um, and what really benefits from, from deeper dives in, in, in the older format of the book. And then, and then lastly, something I, I won't spend too much time on today, um, but you can see more about on my website is um, my, my, my consulting work. Uh, which again is really trying to help mission-driven organizations tell tell better stories about what they're doing specifically in contexts that um, evolve around urban change and i've done that for you know international development banks that are really trying to encourage the, the municipal governments that they work with all around the world to to share best practices in new ways that can be more about sharing lessons learned um, and shared up shared challenges not just you know promoting the the success of a particular project, as well as working with a bunch of local nonprofits um, here where I live in Brooklyn to really try and take stock of what the kind of work they've done and how they can present it to new audiences going forward. Um, but I'll start with the teaching. Um, I've been teaching at Columbia for over 10 years now. Um, and again, uh, and it's, it's on my mind very much because we just started our new semester uh, this morning, actually. So I'm, I'm coming to you fresh after meeting my, my new crop of, of 50 students um, who are from all over the world. All of them are trained as architects. They all have undergraduate degrees in architecture or landscape architecture. Um, and they've come, come to Columbia. And this, this semester, we're still a little bit online for the next three months. Um, to, to learn how to design cities, or so they think. Um, and one of my first acts is to say, well, hold your horses. Um, but first of all, cities aren't designed in the way you are designing a house. Cities are the reflection of a multiplicity of different forces. Um, and those forces include design, but they also include many other things. So we need to learn how to read a city and the various influences upon it, which are in many cases political, economic, sociological, cultural. Um, and they also, a big layer within that is, is um, the narratives that have been produced about cities. I'm, I firmly believe uh, two things. One, that you can't really extricate the, the physical and the social when talking about urban experience, right? The, the, the form of city life and the experience of city life are analytically um, inextricable to my mind but also that the interpretation of urban experience is as constitutive of urban experience as is, is intervention, right? That the physical things we do in cities um, are very much guided and influenced, um, and, then in terms, and then in turn they come to influence the ways in which we represent cities, the way in which we understand cities in, in pop culture and literature, um, certainly in film. So I try and give my students tools to, uh, in, in the first class I teach Reading New York Urbanisms, which is a required class for all the incoming urban designers. It's kind of a mashup of a, of a history of New York City, 
very compressed history of New York City, which I've spent a lot of time thinking about, um, with uh, some skill building around narrative technique, uh, how to use things like um, uh, like the format of a short documentary video about a neighborhood in order not only to learn you know, how to make a video, um, but how to learn really important skills that will, that will stand you in good stead no matter what you do in life, how to interview a stranger, right? How to, um, how to really uh, be able to, to go into a neighborhood and be able to understand what are the institutions and the groups um, that have a particular point of view that is worth my you know, learning about and how can that sort of snowball out to understanding um, uh, in a deeper way some of the conditions that I need to understand in order to represent this place in advance of intervening on it. Um, I've also uh, had the great privilege over the last uh, six years to organize our annual storytelling symposium in the urban design program, which has been a really wonderful opportunity to bring narrative practitioners from outside of the fields of urban design or architecture, qua architecture, into dialogue with students of urban design and students of urban planning. Um, so, you know, we've had uh, filmmakers, novelists, uh, people who work in, in, in sort of the visual arts community, particularly in the community engaged um, visual arts community. Uh, this, this past iteration uh, was specifically about uh, the importance of narrative change for, for the Green New Deal um, and really bringing uh, people from the policy advocacy world and how they understand storytelling um, into dialogue with design students from around the country who were thinking about how to visualize um, new futures uh, in which the Green New Deal was not some ambitious over the horizon policy idea, but, um, but uh, in point of fact, something that was not only necessary, but um, but very much, you know, mainstream and and really bringing the. I think it was. It's always really important to understand the not only the synergies between different disciplines and different approaches to narrative work, but also where the translation doesn't necessarily work, where we lose something in translation between advocacy and architecture, or you know, sociology and planning. I mean, there are our principles in many cases are very um, have a lot in common. Uh, but the languages we use are often very different. And while I'm, you know, I, I like disciplines, <laughs> I think disciplinary knowledge is very important to maintain expertise, um, as well as to maintain, you know, specific skills that we can apply to specific challenges, such as in this case, how do we create a just and equitable energy transformation. Um, but it's important also to really understand the, the, uh, the scale shifts and the translation loss that happens between different ways of talking about things. So that's something I'm increasingly trying to, to focus on. Um, in my, my film and video and installation work, I, I see the sort of, the kinds of stories I tell in that context, very much as communicating spatial nuances to very specific audiences, whether that's creating participatory explorations of complex conditions um, or preparing uh, audiences for, for something they're about to see by giving them a sense of the sensory reality of a place. Um, and really, again, this, this important focus on the sense of place, the spirit of place, what are the audiovisual essences of place and community that can enable us um, to understand a place, even if we haven't necessarily been there yet. Uh, but my first sort of major uh, ambitious undertaking in this regard was the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2006, which was the first time that this very, um, at the time it was the largest architecture exhibition in the world um, that had been going on for some time, um, but it had never really focused specifically on questions of urbanism. It had uh, prior to this primarily focused on, you know, exemplary jewel box architecture uh, that was worthy, you know, that was no critically acclaimed and, and noteworthy for some reason. Um, and this was the first time that the, the Biennale in 2006 really tried to skew away from specific architecture as objects and more to the capacity or potential of architecture to deal with urban challenges. In this moment of unprecedented urban growth, you know, the exhibition curators like to cite the statistic, which I personally absolutely hate, um, which was that in 2007, um, uh, according to the UN projections, over 50% of the world would live in cities, whereas in 1900, it was 10%. I think that's a highly misleading statistic for reasons we can talk about in some other context. However, it did, it did present um, an important sort of call to action around, okay, what are we gonna do about, uh, what are we gonna do about urban challenges? How are we gonna use design in a way that deals with um, uh, key themes such as in the case of this exhibition, mobility, uh, 
density and public space. So they had a lot of statistics. Um, they had a lot of information uh, from the research that the, that the group had done. Uh, this was a research group based at the London School of Economics. You know, this, for example, was Los Angeles, 80% drive to work. They had a lot of aerial photographs and a lot of information, but they didn't really have a, a good strategy for how to evoke the essences of these places that they were trying to represent. Um, and so that's where they uh, brought me in. These were some histograms of residential density, um, uh, you know, extruded and modeled out to show kind of the difference in the central square miles of the 16 cities they were focusing on. And um, my role was to make a um, video montage of each of these cities. And, and at the beginning of the project, the curator asked me, um, okay, so we could do one of two things. We could either, uh, you know, hire a film crew in each city to do a little documentary about each city, or we could um, have someone sort of parachute in and make something that was collectively coherent. And, and I suggested to him, actually both of those options would be insufficient because you want something that is both collectively coherent and responsive to the themes you have articulated of mobility, public space and density, um, but also something that is, you know, specific and authentic to these places. So I devised kind of a hybrid model where I um, solicited unedited footage from local artists and citizens in each city. Um, and then I edited that together into a kind of what I called a polyvocal montage. Uh, but then I, I juxtaposed that even further with um, archival footage from the development of these cities over the past hundred years. You know, cities and cinema have a, have a, conspicuously um, similar time frame, right? Uh, both the, 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 the realization within sociology at first that, that cities were worthy of study um, and were a specific experience with Zimmel and Weber and Durkheim were something that we needed to really understand um, qualitatively and quantitatively. It was really coterminous historically with the invention of new modes of representing time and motion through cinema, right? Both are, both are in the 1880s, 1890s when they, when they come online. And so I really wanted to explore that connection more by juxtaposing this um, sourced, uh, crowdsourced uh, imagery of cities of, of, the, of the 16 cities we were documenting in this exhibition with archival footage um, of those cities. And so I made um, 16 short videos um, from this combination of crowdsourced footage and archival. And then in some cases, if something was missing, I would go to the city and, and shoot a little bit myself. But for the most part, um, it was that hybrid approach. And then a few years later, I got to make a film about my own city, about New York, for an exhibition about 10 years of design and planning in New York, where I chose five neighborhoods, uh, one in each borough, and shot a, you know, a day in the life of New York through these five neighborhoods, all of which had undergone major zoning changes between 2000 and 2010. Um, another exhibition I did was this premiered at the UN. Uh, the, my installation was called Informal Urbanisms, but the exhibition was called Design with the Other 90% Cities. And this was all about design. The exhibition was all about design responses to extreme urban poverty in informal settlements. Um, and again, the curators had all these wonderful design solutions on display from water filtration devices to new housing prototypes, but they didn't have a good strategy for how to communicate what it was like to walk through these spaces. So I created a three screen installation um, with again, footage uh, sourced from local artists in six informal settlements around the world um, that I chose you know, very intentionally for a, a number of reasons. Um, and then I created one common soundtrack that, that uh, followed you throughout, walking throughout the entirety of the UN lobby, um, hearing the sounds of, of street life in these places. And what was most important to me about this exhibition about informal settlements was really um, making it clear that these were more than just spaces of residence, right? A lot of different things happen in these spaces. They are workshops. There's spaces of worship, of play, of education, of construction, They're really trying to get at that complexity through moving image montage. This is um, the exhibition that traveled around the world. This is in Cape Town and um, in St. Louis. A more recent exhibition also for the Cooper Hewitt uh, Smithsonian Design Museum was about um, responses, design responses to poverty in the United States. Um, and for this, I created a four screen installation uh, called Cross Section of Equity. Um, and in this case, the, the sort of crowdsourced approach wasn't necessarily appropriate because um, I wanted to uh, really uncover conditions of poverty that were not visible at street level. So it was necessary to kind of go inside and create interior um, 
pictures of life. And so I did that through a more traditional documentary approach, identifying characters, doing interviews and following um, four people uh, through the course of their daily life in four different places in Ohio. Uh, this is a, a more traditional documentary film I did for UN Habitat, which was really um, a, a kind of filmic response to the new urban agenda, which was unveiled in 2016 in Quito. Um, and again, I used a variety of footage from around the world, some of which I had shot for earlier film projects, um, and some of which was originally sourced to try and um, uh, uh, compress this, this manifesto articulated by these uh, key urban thinkers for how we need to be thinking about cities going forward, um, uh, really as a kind of a repost to the Charter of Athens from the 30s that led to a lot of the top-down mass housing schemes um, that we still live with. And then finally, my research um, and publication work, uh, I see that really a, the main thrust there is connecting local practices to, to global conversations. Um, City Makers, the, the book um, that I published in 2017, really comes out of, of, of this idea of how can we actually sort of create a new identity around who is actually making urban space and who is actually making urban change and how can we kind of expand the um, definition of how we think about change making, how we think about city making um, to encompass a, a wide range of other practices and roles that aren't traditionally understood as, as within the sort of intentional uh, city making disciplines, right? Um, you know, I, I, as I said at the beginning, I think of myself primarily as an urbanist. Um, and what that word or identity connotes to me is someone who studies cities and studies urban dynamics from a little bit of an academic remove. Um, and I think that's a very, very, very important role for scholarship, for education, um, for, you know, for deep understanding. But I was also interested in this notion of um, what are some other roles that are uh, deeply active and constitutive of urban space and urban experience that aren't necessarily part of how we think about and study cities. Because, um, you know, oftentimes I think when we think about city making, to the extent that we do, we're thinking about this kind of idea, right? This is Brooklyn Bridge Park, a beautiful, beautiful design that's very much, um, you know, realized as a completed landscape that is very much oriented around the consumption of the skyline as a, you know, visual delight. So that is a very important part of city making, but it's by no means the extent of it. Similar, you know, really important infrastructural um, investments in the built environment, such as this 34th Street ferry terminal, um, incredibly important piece of architecture that's also part of the city making conversation, but it's not the extent of it. I also wanted to think about city making as a way that includes the people who actually build our cities, the, the, um, the physical labor and the decision making that goes into um, making cities. I mean, I always throw my students for a loop when I remind them that Architects um, don't even really design buildings necessarily. They design systems of information for other people to make buildings. And I think it's really important when we think about how our cities are made to think about how that materially gets done and by whom, both from a labor perspective, but also in terms of thinking about um, uh, broadening out the constituency of, 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 of for whom a city is made and by whom a city is made. And it's not just those whose, whose jobs or professions it is to make cities or to think about cities, but those who volunteer, right? Those who spend um, leisure time thinking about changing spaces, intervening in spaces in ways that are sometimes very, very, very low investment, uh, low tech. I, I write at length in the book about um, Corona Plaza, which was sort of an underutilized traffic circle in a, in a highly, highly dense neighborhood um, just below the elevated railway there. Um, and what started as a very informal group of local business owners, you know, stringing up Christmas lights um, and Diwali lights um, and, and, and really trying to create some sense of space in this traffic circle, then turned in through a series of very interesting coalitions between the business owners, the local residents, the Queens Museum, and then eventually the Department of Transportation um, to turn this into a public plaza that was very different, had a very different set of uses than a park, right? This was a place in which uh, immigration classes would take place, in which dance uh, rehearsals would take place, um, in which there would be sort of, you know, public programming of a particular kind that really took advantage of underutilized space. And, and I write about this kind of in contrast to the High Line, which was coming about the exact same period of time with a tremendous amount of investment, a tremendous amount of um, really, really specific real estate economics, really, really specific development, 
priorities in terms of this very expensive part of Manhattan. And here you had um, another transformation of infrastructure into public space uh, using a completely different set of skills and a completely different set of logics about what space is and how you can transform it. Um, you know, the volunteer piece also extends to people who are taking care of the natural environment in cities, whether they're, they're farming in East New York um, on my right or, or watering spontaneous plants in Guanas on my left. Um, and then finally, the other, the other piece of the tent that I really wanted to extend this identity to was um, people working in, in public servants. Um, you know, I, I love this image because it kind of speaks to, I think, this is a, a, a building that has a lot of municipal offices in it, or did at one point downtown in Manhattan. Um, you know, we often think about uh, infrastructure only when it breaks, right? Only when a water main, water main breaks. Um, but the amount of intentional choice making that goes into maintaining these systems is something we really need to encourage greater intimacy with um, if we are going to successfully advocate for public investment. And I think that, that it bringing, bringing uh, public service more squarely into a conversation around urban change making is a necessary component of that. Um, all of this work on, our, on, on City Makers uh, came from this online magazine that I was, of which I was the founding editor way back in 2008 uh, called Urban Omnibus, which still exists and is a really wonderful resource that I encourage everyone to check out. Um, I, I stopped working there um, in 2000, uh, uh, being in 2015, but it continues to be a really, really important resource for New York City. Uh, each week, we would highlight uh, someone who was making the city a better place in some way. We like to think of it as good ideas for the future of cities that were tried and tested um, right here in New York. Um, and so, you know, one week we might interview an architect, but the next week, someone who does murals. Um, so the next week, a civil engineer, the next week, a community advocate. And what I realized a little bit late in the game after you know, four or five years of doing this is that what I really had on my hands was a, was a unique uh, oral history of people who were trying to make their neighborhoods just a little bit better. And even though none of the people that I interviewed for this online magazine were necessarily directly thinking of themselves in terms of the great existential threats facing the planet, um, when I looked at them all as a group, I really saw some, some really amazing ways in which the kinds of language they were using about very local change really connected us um, to these broader, broader urban challenges and how we might meet them. And by existential threats, I mean, of course, you know, the first two are obvious, climate change um, and wealth inequality. But the third one, which I think was less obvious at the time and is starting to become more a part of the public conversation is the crisis of trust between citizens and government. So, so part of my ambition in trying to draw a new line around who is making cities today um, was to include some of the roles that, that think about that actively in order to kind of challenge um, uh, the ways in which we think about who, who are gonna provide solutions to those three challenges and how they are in fact um, intimately and inextricably connected. So to do that, I kind of repackaged a lot of the stories that we've done and, and kind of wove them through a, uh, an intellectual history of urbanism to come up with a series of um, imperatives, a manifesto, if you will, for uh, how we can take the traditional categories of, of urban practice and infuse them with, um, with moral priorities, right? With specific values that can not only meet the moment, um, but also can encourage a, a greater sense of participation. So for public space, uh, that was incorporate long-term use and maintenance along with the practice of citizenship into any discussion of public space design and delivery. And that's true whether it's the, you know, the urban farms of East New York, which I write about in the very beginning of the book, or uh, building birdhouses along the Gowanus. Uh, for infrastructure, which is the next chapter, um, this was very much, for me, the imperative was how to reconceive infrastructure as a multifunction public good and, and a constituent element of landscape, right? We used to consider infrastructure and landscape together as coordinated parts of an urban system. Uh, this is the Manhattan Bridge done from what is now Manhattan Chinatown. But of course now um, with the ways in which we think of infrastructure as single purpose, which has led to a great breakdown in public understanding for the need for infrastructure investment. Um, you know, if you, fit, if you fit a function too tightly to its purpose, uh, it's gonna become quite brittle. So really trying to, to integrate uh, that thinking back in, drawing examples from the Staten Island Blue Belt, um, from this, you know, wonderful narrative example of a of understanding the sewer system. This is a story I wrote about about a, about a photographer who started out as a sewer diver, um, just a punk kid who liked to crawl into places he wasn't supposed to be. Um, 
and then turn this into a massive map of the pre-urban hydrology and the sewer system, really, really with the deep belief that encouraging greater intimacy in the intricacies of our sewer system um, would foster greater public awareness of the need for different kinds of specific investment and intervention. Talk about technology in terms of trying to, trying to push back against the need to disrupt everything, but rather trying to embrace technologies that support democratic governance. So instead of monitoring, exclusively thinking about what is technologically possible, instead thinking about what is technologically desirable, which is actually trying to encourage uh, community control over some of these opaque systems of techno technology. This is um, the Red Hook Wi-Fi project uh, right after Superstorm Sandy, um, thinking about the, the total redesign of the experience of the Department of Probation. I looked at this example in depth. Um, and then finally got to housing, which has become sort of the passion that's driven um, the last few years of my life and research. How can we reconfigure existing housing to meet shifting demographic needs? And through working on the housing chapter, um, I got exposed to the work of the uh, Urban Homesteading Assistance Board, which has launched me on this new journey, um, which I'm currently on, of uh, looking at self-help housing, um, incremental approaches to shelter uh, since 1965. And I'm at, I'm at sort of the... Um, midway through the beginning phase of the research for this. Um, but the book really came about because um, I was thinking about uh, this example of the Urban Homesteading Assistance Board and I was interviewing um, the executive director. Uh, this is an organization that in the 70s during the crisis of, of abandonment um, and of, of in-rem foreclosure of the city taking over you know, tax lien properties uh, with derelict landlords, um, came up with the idea of, okay, with a little bit of technical assistance, uh, those families that choose to stay, if, if we give them the tools to rehabilitate their own homes, maybe we can convince the city to transfer the deed to those. So, so that's why they were called homesteaders. Um, and this seems like a very specific New York City 1970s type thing. But when I was talking to um, the staff there, uh, they told me this incredible story of how the idea for this organization came about uh, based on a conference that happened at St. John the Divine in 1972, um, when in thinking about the sort of challenges facing Harlem at the time, uh, they invited a bunch of people, many of whom were, were uh, Catholic and Episcopal priests who had been working um, in conditions of rural poverty and increasingly urban poverty in Latin America, West Africa, and South Asia, to come and talk about some of their experiences um, in, in, in very vulnerable uh, low-income housing environments. And you know, they made the obvious point that throughout the majority of human history, people have built their own homes. So um, why can't we do that for multifamily dwellings in a dense city like New York? And I became sort of obsessed with the idea that this was a, a, a really interesting solution that was applied in New York City, it was applied in Detroit, it was applied in, in Wilmington, Delaware in very interesting ways. But this is an idea that really came from um, uh, the Global South and moved uh, northwards. Um, and so I've begun this long process of kind of tracing this intellectual history of um, how architecture and planning and urbanism more broadly have um, encountered questions of poverty and questions of uh, insecure housing. Um, and, and they're basically these three major moments that I'll be talking about in the book. One is kind of the the avant-garde architecture version of this, um, of, of architects really designing environments around the world that uh, low-income residents could then adapt um, over time. This is a famous recent example in Chile. Uh, this was a famous example in the 60s in Lima, Peru. Um, but then also how this same idea then influenced development economics um, and sort of multilateral lending institutions like the World Bank, who then in this, as sort of a response of the perceived failures of mass housing schemes um, in the you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, decided to try this out um, in, a, in a development economics framework of giving people access to low cost building materials, a plot of land um, where the local government would build a sort of sanitary core of a bathroom with running water and then invite um, the residents to build the rest of the house themselves with their own specifications. And this idea was very interesting. It did not meet the targets for units, um, which I, I obviously is a problematic measure that we can talk about in another context. Um, and so largely uh, ceased to be a strategy after, um, after the mid eighties. Uh, but nobody's really in a systematic way gone back and looked at some of the neighborhoods that were um, 
that were developed through this way. So I've started that work. Uh, this is one I visited in Pereira, uh, Colombia. Um, you know, the, this neighborhood is literally called 2,500 lots, <laughs> um, which uh, speaks to the, the, um, the way it was originally devised. So I've, I've started this work uh, trying to sort of understand how some of these neighborhoods thrived and some of these neighborhoods did not, um, because there hasn't been a lot of post-occupancy evaluation about them. But I think what's really important and core to this and what it connects it to my earlier work is really this notion of, of, of how do ideas travel and what is the role of narrative and storytelling in how ideas travel. I mean, in, in the case of the housing emergency, you know, we really can't mess around. Um, the, the proportion of, of humans on the planet living in substandard housing will, will soon be one in three. Um, you know, I, I don't need to remind this particular audience of uh, the specificities of extremely rent burdened people um, in, in New York City and other places, not just cities, but in rural contexts as well around the country and around the world. Um, so in addition to coming up with new solutions, we also need to investigate overlooked solutions from our recent past. And, and I'm not suggesting that incremental housing or self-help housing is a panacea to these challenges. Um, there were lots of problems with it, um, but we kind of, you know, threw the baby out with the bathwater and there are a lot of recent ideas that came from smaller cities and were applied in larger cities that we need to really understand. In order to do that, we need to activate our ability to listen, right? To use um, storytelling skills like oral history, like deep engagement, like problem co-identification and asset mapping, um, and really bring those into our arsenal as urbanists in order to um, not just change the policies, but really change the story of, in this case, you know, what a house is and what a house does, right? how housing performs in our lives, right? It's more than just um, an asset, uh, which, is, which is, I think, the assumption, the deep story that housing is an asset um, has really kind of um, uh, obstructed a lot of possibilities for thinking creatively about how we can meet the very deep needs that we have, not just in terms of housing, but housing as a part of a system that also includes meeting the needs of, of climate change and inequality. Um, which again, I think are inextricable just as much as, you know, the social and physical experience of cities are inextricable and just as much as the interpretation of cities is inextricable from whatever it is we seek to uh, propose to intervene in them. Um, so I'll leave it at that and I would love to hear some, um, to enter into conversation with you guys um, about any of this or, or, or what it makes you think of in terms of your own, your own work. Um, so Deepak, I'll start with you um, and then I would love to open it up. Wonderful. Um, Kasim, there's actually a, a torrent of questions. That was an amazing talk and a lot of appreciation for the, the richness and the breadth and the, and the depth. Um, so I'm actually going to try to combine some of them and a little bit of some thematic um, buckets for you. So here's a pair. Um, in terms of planning as a discipline, are there stories that have become hegemonic, Jane Jacobs, at the expense of others? Are there stories about cities that you think are particularly pernicious with respect to advancing the needs of the urban poor? And then a kind of related question is about um, how, how you deal with powerful actors uh, with a narrative that aim to perpetuate injustices through story and how to make the voices of oppressed groups kind of come to life um, through story in narrative to, to overcome that. So a couple of related questions there for you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely a lot of stories <laughs> about cities. I mean, you know, I, I think if you look in very broad strokes at kind of the overview of planning as a discipline, um, a lot of, you know, what, what Jane Jacobs and that moment of resistance in the 60s really represented, um, uh, led to kind of the, the discrediting of planning as a profession because planning was so deeply invested in that point in time with these, um, you know, top-down master plans, right? Um, and what's, what's ironic, but I think is probably true in lots of different stories is that, in lots of different sectors rather, is that then the tools of the resistance against that top-down, um, uh, you know, raising of neighborhoods, of ramming infrastructure through neighborhoods, of of deeply, deeply racist policies around housing, uh, but also around infrastructure access and infrastructure provision. Mm -hmm. What what is deeply ironic is that the tools of resistance to fight that have become their own um, cliche that have become something where, in the case of Jane Jacobs, 
people have really taken the um, confused the message with the method, I think, in ways that are actually damaging to mm. the kind of city we want to see. Um, I, I, I don't personally think that she was saying everywhere needs to look like the West Village. <laughs> um, that was that was what she saw when she looked out her window every day. And what I think the better message to draw from her work is, um, is that we need to learn by looking. Hmm. You know, we need to proceed from the particulars to the general. Um, and this is what I see every day. What do you see every day? What do you see that's working in your neighborhood? And what are some ways that you can argue through telling the story of what you see um, for that to be uh, a part of how we measure success, right? I think that the um, her her tools of resistance, as I said, were very much about sort of documenting exactly what she was seeing in very particular ways, but it was not meant to be prescriptive. I mean, she herself said that Death and Life of Great American Cities was not her favorite book that she wrote. Um, it was The Economy of Cities, in which really, in a very, very um, ahead of its time way gets into systems thinking about um, uh, um, complexity theory, basically. And the idea that anytime you try and um, freeze the, the uh, elements of analysis in order to analyze them or measure them, um, you lose sight of the way in which when they are coordinated and dynamic, they can't be measured, right? Um, and this was something that very much is, is something that we think about in information technology a lot and we think about in other forms of systems theory, but haven't necessarily applied that lesson in the way in which we think about cities, where now we both have the resurgence of top-down big idea master planning fostered by the growth of so much technology that enables us to measure things in ways that we confuse with the truth, right? Um, and so I think that is a very pernicious idea that we can use measurement and quantification exclusively in a way that is neutral, right? And this, you know, I mean, this is not, this is coming up a lot in AI right now in terms of how people are thinking about the racism that's embedded into AI programs. Um, the, I think the, um, but I think we need to apply that to systems as well, right? I think we definitely need to apply it to, you know, I mean, and, and we're seeing right now in terms of the mayoral debate, right? A lot of dealing with the contested legacy of a information and data-based approach to all kinds of security regimes um, that you, I'm appalled at the extent to which people still consider those to be neutral because they were data-based, <laughs> it's even in today's day and age. So I think that's a very pernicious, it's a very pernicious worldview. And I actually think if we think about storytelling critically as a skill, we can use it not to suggest that everything needs to be subjective all the time, but, and therefore specific and therefore untrustworthy, but rather the opposite, that we can use deep listening to actually counter these master narratives um, by inserting a little bit of human cognition and perception and local experience and applying it upwards to those larger upstream to those larger systems. Um, so I think that's a really important skill that planning needs to invest in as a discipline. But I think all of the urban disciplines need to think about that and how it applies to their own tool sets in order to, you know, use storytelling, but also recognize that big stories are also part of the problem. That was a really fascinating answer. And you might have actually bridged into a couple of these next questions. Um, so as someone who works with architects and urban designers, teaching, editing, urban omnibus, collaborating on a whole bunch of projects, from your perspective, what do you think may be most missing from professional design education? So that's kind of one part. And then a somewhat related question, how might storytelling help teachers and civil servants understand the communities that they work in and serve? Yeah. Um, the answer to the first one is easy, writing. <laughs> I mean, I, um, you know, was trained as a filmmaker. I'm very pleased to see the, you know, public appreciation for the importance of visual means of communicating, uh, but that cannot come at the expense of like basic expository rhetorical <laughs> ability to communicate. Um, and, and that becomes, you know, very important in my own particular teaching context because uh, the vast majority of my students are, um, uh, are their primary language is not English. Um, but e even thinking about, and it's not just writing, it's, I guess, 
I guess it's rhetoric, right? Oral presentation and written presentation, the importance of actually making an argument and articulating an argument and then using a lot of the defamiliarizing visual techniques that I prioritize um, as ways to support that, um, not as you know an end in themselves in, in the context of professional practice for students. Um, and then what was the second question? It's kind of more broadly, I think you've already touched on it. It's teachers, uh, civil servants, how they might use storytelling for um, kind of understanding the communities that they're working in. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that there's, I mean, there is definitely always been a tradition in, you know, in the, the physical side of, of city making, in design and in planning. You do always start with, you know, one board or one slide of, okay, this is the map of the community. And now here's the things we're gonna do. And civil servants do this a lot. Um, and there has been a tradition, you know, going back a couple of generations now of also having something like a community engagement process where you get, you know, citizens to put dots on a map or sticky notes to say, okay, here's a challenge and here's an opportunity. Um, I think we're in a moment right now where that has become so prevalent as kind of a, an indicator, a tokenistic indicator that we have engaged community that I think now we're really in a moment of map washing, <laughs> quite literally, where we're using that kind of plan view and overhead uh, description, right? It's, that's a description. It's not actions. It's not characters. It's not even setting, really. It's location, but it's not context, right? So using those kinds of map or aerial photograph view to say, OK, here's the site, and then here's all the things we're going to do with it, I think is a missing opportunity to really encourage your audience, whether they are you know, elected officials or community members, to understand the experience of that place, not just mm -hmm. the facts and figures of that place. And so I really think, you know, I mean, I, I loved watching the, um, the pre-roll YouTube video of, of the School of Labor and Urban Studies, um, really sort of you know, showing uh, cities in motion. It was a very compelling, got me really hyped up, especially because the music was like, we built the city on rock and roll and stuff. Um, but then I thought it was really interesting that that video ended on a shot of the Freedom Tower <laughs> um, as an icon of the city, uh, which it is, you know, visually. But the um, but it's it seemed to me to be a little bit incommensurate with um, with the experience of the street, right? That idea of looking at the city from uh, at, at the sort of coherent visual frame of the skyline as opposed to that of the neighborhood. Um, and I think it's important to think about what are some details, some visual details and experiential details and narrative details that we can put into our public presentations, whether it's for elected officials or for community members um, that really get at the experience of place, not just the, um, the location of place and the list mm -hmm. of challenges and then the hopefully the list of possibilities. Yeah, super answer. I'm I'm gonna now demand Stevie Wonder be the uh, the soundtrack for every single thing at SLU. Um, that was great. So um, this is one of my questions too. Um, how has the year long pandemic and its economic, cultural, and use of space impacts influenced the way that you think about the next several years for major cities like New York? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are so many ways to answer that, and it's going to be so interesting. And we are nowhere near the point at which we can, in any with any kind of social scientific rigor, talk about it yet, because I don't think we've really seen the data. And I think people are really jumping the gun and talking about, you know, locational trends in terms of where people are moving and whatnot. Um, definitely the most... Um, uh, improvisational, ephemeral, and perhaps transformative thing that absolutely has changed things and will continue to is the public recognition of the amount of space that parking lanes take up, um, which is really based on the innovation of the restaurants um, in, in meeting the needs to stay alive. And the, fa and the fact that unlike the majority of permitting processes in New York City, that was in the first generation, pretty equitable and pretty low barrier to entry. They then revised it for you know, impact studies against cars and it became less equitable. But in the beginning, in the first blush of last summer, um, it was both in terms of permitting and in terms of the use of space, something that really allowed people to see just you know, what, that that is too part of the public realm, right? But that is not a, a taking <laughs> of some, some 
you know, ordained right to be able to park. Um, and, and you obviously saw the biking community, which has been very active and vociferous for years, you know, hop onto that and be like, you know, kill the car, et cetera. And I think some of that rhetoric has gotten elevated in particular ways because of our response to the pandemic. I think there are really interesting questions to be seen that have to do not only with real estate in terms of the use of space, but real estate in terms of the property tax revenues for the city and the city budget um, coming in, particularly with respect to, to corporate and commercial real estate. I don't think people of privilege who work on computers like me will always work from home. I mean, I right now, as an example, I'm in a co-working space about 300 feet from, from my house. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of that, a lot more of local, um, uh, you know, things that you used to do on a commute you're doing within your neighborhood. That's been one of the greatest silver linings of this tragic, tragic year for me is just the both the solidarity and the mutual aid in my neighborhood, but also just seeing people every day and having to talk to them because I couldn't just smile underneath my mask. <laughs> um, and so, but at the same time, then you have a whole bunch of urbanists who are now seizing upon that as, okay, now the 15 minute city, the 15 minute city and everybody's, which, you know, will work for some segment of the population, but it's not gonna work for the um, majority of people who kept the city running when we were, you know, who were delivering our food when we were working at home. Um, and I don't think the data is in yet about how we can use this, um, you know, idea of essential workers to really lift up essential work um, and respect it in ways uh, through policy and through wages, but also through infrastructure, right? Also through, I mean, the, the, the ways, the innovations of restaurants haven't just been in, you know, using public space differently, um, but also in how they're getting, you know, their food to you. And, you know, you, you're gonna see a lot of contestation between people who want their food delivered in a very specific amount of time, but also don't want a mechanized bicycle on their sidewalk. Well, then maybe you have to wait a little longer for your food. So the, um, I think these are some unanswered questions that we'll continue to um, grapple with over the next few years. I'm very much looking forward to, to being a part of research, of asking questions of, of these transformations. Um, but I think the commercial real estate thing is gonna be a really interesting challenge. And I hope we can figure out ways to use the excess capacity um, of mi Midtown Manhattan for other uses, um, whether it's emergency housing or or other ways of of thinking about space, um, I don't I don't I don't see the political will there for that yet. But I think maybe when we get the new budget and we realize <laughs> what the taxes are, there might be some more movement on that. We'll see. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating, and the role of storytelling will be so important in that um, th that future. So a couple of questions really about memories. So one's from the UK. Um, I'd be really interested in Kasim's reflections on the interface between stories, place, and memory. In particular, what does Kasim think about the importance of individual and collective memory in telling the stories of New York? And then a related one about, um, so documentary is, you may disagree with this, documentary is inherently about the past simply by dint of process observational work as a different kind of defamiliarization. Uh, and then the question is sort of about other modes, I think, particularly suggesting science fiction as a way uh -huh. of imagination. So two stories kind of about past, present, and future sure. time. Uh, no, fascinating. Those are both really interesting questions that we could spend a whole lot of time on. I think the role of memory is crucially important. And um, I mean, we're seeing it right now, uh, the, I think oftentimes the way in which we think about the role of memory in moving the needle on public policy issues has to do with um, like testimony, right? I think we were all deeply moved seeing an 107 year old survivor of the Tulsa race massacre testify um, in Congress about her actual memories. And that held, you know, so much more weight, unfortunately, than had that been historical. Um, thing and not someone in the present day. So I think there is an emphasis on sort of bearing witness um, that that very much comes to us through an understanding of like legal proceedings and, uh, you know, court approaches to things, whether it's human rights abuses in The Hague or whatever else, the role of testimony and understanding um, the need to create some kind of intervention, whether it's legislation or prosecution or whatever. But I think there is, um, a much 
deeper or not much deeper, but a much broader application of it um, that isn't necessarily about um, harm, um, but is actually about asset identification, right? Um, and I think that there's a really, and again, I, I don't think that needs to be always aggregated to be a socially scientifically defensible like data pool of, okay, this is my favorite thing in my neighborhood. Um, but I think really using ethnographic techniques, interviewing techniques, oral history techniques to really understand um, not just the challenges, not just the harms, but also the assets. And a lot of that has to do with people, right? In a lot of neighborhoods, I think one of the greatest assets, well, in all neighborhoods, the greatest asset is the people, but in many neighborhoods, the greatest asset are a particular group of people who, who have appointed themselves to be containers of community memory. And they're not always reliable narrators, right? We can't necessarily take the the um, you know person who has appointed him or herself to be the mayor of one block um, to tell a full and comprehensive story of that neighborhood, but they are very important interlocutors that we really need to invest in. And this is something that I think we used to actually know. I mean, you know, I talked about the grand master projects of the WPA in terms of huge infrastructure projects like the Tennessee Valley Authority, but you know, at the same time, you had the Farm Security Administration photographs at, uh, and, uh, you know, white sharecroppers are the most famous ones, even though there were many more besides them, um, but also oral history, right, of the slave narratives, of, of really sort of looking at how we can do individual interviews and create an archive. Uh, and now, you know, I think one of the best things we can use digital technology for is not for measuring performance dimensions of urban experience, but for creating new ways to search through um, large archives of, you know, we don't need to be um, intimidated by how much tape it would take <laughs> to do a large scale oral history project because we can make it in such a way that it is searchable. Um, so I think that those, I think that's where library science will become a really important skill set that we also need to apply to, to urbanism, right? How do we manage huge amounts of information, but do so with intention, with a real respect for the ethics of data collection, but also the ethics of data uh, you know, data hygiene in how we ask questions of the data, um, but also putting into our data sources uh, people talking about themselves. And I think, you know, I think um, small scale entrepreneurial uh, thing, you know, like StoryCorps, you know, is I think an unbelievably powerful example of, of just how universal and essential it is the notion of creating some formal process, even if you're, you know, interviewing your, your grandparent. Um, that you might not have done without this very specific format that's very simple, right? It's a trailer and two microphones. Um, but I think that's really proven just how important it is to so many people. And now the challenge becomes how do we use that as a resource to identify not only challenges, but also assets and through them opportunities to enhance existing things that are working um, while intervening um, to shape those things that might not be working in a particular neighborhood. And in terms of science fiction, I think speculation is incredibly important. Speculative fiction has been a really, really wonderful thing in terms of, I mean, but so much speculative fiction has been so dystopian, except for Star Trek, which is the weird outlier. But like, you know, um, Blade Runner, <laughs> Minority Report, like these are the things that um, are, continue to have the sort of dystopian vision of either panoptic uh, surveillance <laughs> or, um, or other kinds of ways of, of um, yeah, seeing kind of a, a pretty negative, fu negative future for technology. Um, and I think the way to use speculation in interesting ways um, is to also think about um, like counterfactual speculation, right? Which is what like steampunk is <laughs> kind of, right? It's, it's, it's using a future, but with old technology, right? What would it be if we were still using trains, but we had all these other technologies, but we hadn't gone to take the digital leap? And I think there are lots of other examples like that, that we could really see. I mean, I think we're seeing it now in terms of rethinking air travel because of its consumption, right? Like, okay, the Hindenburg was pretty bad, but dirigibles and blimps might actually be something that can get us in a very luxurious and leisurely way across the Atlantic in a few more hours, but um, but you can walk around, you don't have to be buckled in, and it uses a lot less carbon. So I think, again, to look into the future, we have to look into the past, both in terms of memory, but also in terms of um, technological assumptions from the past that might be applicable in new ways today.
Well, there are a lot more questions, and um, I think people have been fascinated, as I have, by this conversation in your talk. And a lot of folks are asking, "Will this be? Has this been recorded? It has been, so you can go to the SLU website and uh, and check it out and review it." I want to thank Kasim for an amazing conversation with us that covered a tremendous amount of ground and connected a huge amount of dots and introduced, for many of us, some new methods and ways of thinking about uh, urban space professions and social change. So on behalf of the School of Labor and Urban Studies, I want to thank everybody in the audience for joining us today. And um, thanks, Kasim, for a wonderful talk. Thank you so much, Deepak. And thank you to the whole uh, SLU team. This has been such a pleasure for me. And um, I look forward to staying in touch. You, um, uh, I think I put my thing in the chat. Um, yes, you can find me here. And here. And let's keep in touch. Thank you all so much. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon.